Um, well, I went to a liberal arts college in the Midwest that was very progressive and, um, well, left-wing, um, kind of had a tradition of left-wing politics. Um, it was investigated by the uh, McCarthy Commission in the 50s uh, because they had a course on communism, which was really um, not acceptable at the time. Uh, forget that it was educational. But anyway, so I arrived and mainly I, I went to this college because my mother thought it was a great place to go. Um, I wasn't so keen, but they accepted me and gave me money and nobody else gave me as much money as they did. So that's where I went. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. And I became totally politicized there. Um, in the, well, um, we supported various causes at that time, at that, in that era, which was late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the only thing I can really remember is um, Fair Play for Cuba and, of course, civil rights, which this is so typical. I think it's gendered. But anyway, um, a bunch of my friends actually were freedom writers and went south. And I kind of felt like, oh my God, you know, this is a black and white issue. I don't really have a place in there. And I think that was me being a holding back woman. Because I have a friend um, who was in Canada at the time. He saw the, the lunch counter um, uh, shots the footage and he said I'm going down there and he just took off from college he just took off and um and joined SNCC and I think about that and he had another Japanese American friend who was down there as well and I just trying to figure out why did I think that wasn't my issue and I and I think at the time it was me thinking, oh, you know, I don't really feel comfortable. I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to intrude in something that, you know, may not be for me, may not, I might not be accepted in that issue. So going on, went to New York after college, and of course, it was feminism. It was you know, all the women's lib and bra burning and stuff like that. And, and I was totally supportive and realized that in all of those left-wing politics in college, it was the men who did everything, organized everything, did shit. The women kind of took notes and brought coffee. And, you know, we did like the behind things. We did the housekeeping, right? Um, we were the wives of the real people doing things. And, you know, that was, that was an interesting thing I learned from feminism and um, gave, gave me a different viewpoint on how I would deal with politics from then, right? Like, why am I in the kitchen? Um, then when I came to Canada, there were many things that took place between my getting to Canada. But when I came to Canada, I was drawn into, oddly, through a baseball game, into a um, working with a group of people on a history of the Japanese in Canada. Here I was, a Japanese American, working on a history of the Japanese in Canada, but the history is very similar. Um, and so I thought, this, I have things to, I can contribute. And it was interesting, this group was half Shinisei 
and half sanse. And the Shinise were very um, strong in the group. This wasn't something that was spearheaded necessarily by the sensei, although we all did work on it, but it was truly a collaborative effort between the Shinisei and the sensei. And it kind of made me more aware of myself as of Japanese heritage. Because previous to that, really all my connections had been with whites. The only Japanese I knew were family, which meant that all of this group immediately became my family. <laughs> I mean, that's how I related to them, right? Because it was the only way I really knew how to relate to Japanese. And so it was a very, it was a great experience from the project then, in 1977, it was the 100-year the, um, anniversary of the first Jap official Japanese immigrant to Canada, Manzo Nagano. And um, the feds were pouring money into our community to do a national celebration. And one of the proposals was again by a Shinisei, who had also been part of the photo project, that, um, that they do a festival. And it was all, it was, it was a big deal. The Nisei, who were of course the ones in charge of the money, um, weren't so sure it was a great idea to do a festival. First of all, it's calling attention to ourselves. Um, and they weren't sure that was a great idea. On the other hand, we had got this money to celebrate this occasion. So, but then it was like, but who would come? You know, we're gonna pour all this money in, right? Who would come? <laughs> what if nobody comes? And we're like, eh, come on, we'll just do it. We'll do it where the Japanese used to be. Um, on Powell Street and the Powell grounds, there were a few Japanese businesses, but not many. There were seniors who lived in the neighborhood. Um, but it was kind of, it was very run down. That neighborhood had much deteriorated. But, you know, it was decided to do the festival in this park where the Asahi baseball team used to play and reclaim it as ours. And so Powell Street Festival was born. And well, a bunch of people who had gone to university together and become politicized by a Japanese American teacher he came up and he started a group that they, they called the Asian Canadian students something. And, um, and they all kind of got, you know, became aware of themselves as a force. And it included Japanese and Chinese Canadians who were all going to UBC. And a bunch of them had gone to Japan checking out their roots, right? Um, came back and started working at this um, senior center, Tonarigumi. They had the language and they wanted to work in the community. And actually it was the, the man who ran Tonarigumi who proposed the festival. And then he had all these sansei who were working for him who helped with the festival. And so the festival kind of came out of this Asian Canadian sense of identity, right? It was like a perfect meeting of money <laughs> and celebration and assertion of, you know, heritage. So 
And I was one of the people who worked on Powell Street Festival, having been brought in through the photo project. And, and it was really exciting. The second year, San Jose Tycho came up. And, and that looked like so much fun. I mean, we'd seen Onikosa, and we were really impressed. It was like strong and powerful, and it was great. But it wasn't something you would look at it and say, oh, I want to do that, because there were all these men up there, and half naked, and, you know, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but San Jose Taiko, they were like us. They were sensei, they were mixed men and women, and they laughed and they had fun, and they were powerful. And then they were billeted with us, you know, amongst the community, and they encouraged all of us that we should do it. You know, I mean, we fawned over them and said they were terrific, and they said, you can do it, you should do it too. And so we did. And we did start out with the notion that we wanted to be um, a strong Asian presence in the performing arts and a strong presence of women who would break down stereotypes of what an Asian woman is. Um, Madame Butterfly or Susie Wong, right? Um, we would be tough and strong. And so when KT, then KT, Katari Taiko, was the name of the group. The first Taiko group in Canada. We were all Asian Canadian. Um, and then at a certain point, we ran a workshop and we decided to recruit. And lo and behold, some white people wanted to join the group, which never really occurred to us that they would want to do that. And so we had to talk about it. So I should say, katari taiko means talking drums. Katari, and it wasn't the drums, it was us. Because we were a collective, we did really talk a lot. And so that became our name. We thought it was very appropriate. <laughs> so, White people in the group, really tricky. Um, I did an interview with a woman um, for a book that Tamiya Wakayama and I put together. He was the photographer on Powell Street Festival. And, I, and one of the interviews I asked this woman, well, how would you feel about, um, you know, if, if Katari Taiko took in um, non-Asian people? And she said, well, we should, you know, it should be open to everybody. But seeing a blonde person up there playing taiko, I don't know. And so, you know, I thought about that when we were having our discussions. On the other hand, there was so much out marriage in the Japanese Canadian community that there were all these partners who were white who were active in the community, who supported us. And then there were the children who were half, eventually gonna be quarter, eighth. At what point do we say, 16th, you're not Japanese, you can't join the group, you, you know, you're not Asian, there's not enough of it. So it just became a non-issue because we were a community group. We were the community group. And we had to represent the community. And the community included all kinds of white people as partners, mostly fathers. You know, so, so we did, we opened, up, we opened it up to pretty much anybody because we were a community group. But we were also political. And one of the, in the questions, when we recruit people, we always do interviews and we lay it right out. Okay, we support certain causes. We support unions. 
we, are, we do peace, peace marches and demonstrations. And you have to be comfortable with that or you shouldn't play in our group. And everybody agreed. I mean, there was one guy who said, well, I'm probably not as left as you are, but all of the things that you mentioned, I can completely support. And he said, so I think I'm gonna be fine. And he was fine. He played for everything. Um, so KT, I don't know where KT stands now in terms of activism. I assume they, they are still pursuing it. I mean, doing benefits and stuff like that. Things have calmed down, it seems, more in Vancouver. I mean, I belong now to a group called Sawagi, which is an exclusive group. Um, we are only East Asian and Indigenous women. And, um, and the, it doesn't feel so bad now because there are other groups. If people aren't, I mean, when we were Katani Taiko, we were the only thing in town. So if you didn't join us, you were not going to do Taiko. Now, there's a lot of choice. You can play for a bunch of different people if you're a man or if you're white. There are alternatives. So we can be exclusive and not feel terrible. <laughs> Because we're just an aspect, right? Um, and we do play for a lot of women's things. We play for um, unions, multicultural stuff. Um, we also play for corporations, if they're not really, really bad. Um, and we do make choices about who we play for. We will not play for anybody. And we always want to know who we are playing for before we take a gig. Um, I don't know. There, there aren't. So what, probably the last thing that Sawagi did in terms of performance, and we, of course, we haven't performed in months, but in terms of activist performance was there have been uh, the downtown east side of Vancouver is very poor, full of homeless people, full of SROs that are in terrible condition. And one of them was closing down. It was closed down because it was unlivable. I mean, really unlivable. And the owners wouldn't do anything to fix it up. So the city said, you're finished. Well, then there were these people out on the street. What are they gonna do? That was what, it might've been terrible, but it was inside and it had running water. The toilet, sometimes not, you know, heat, sometimes not. Windows, sometimes broken and not repaired, but it was somewhere inside where they could be, be safe. And so these people ended up, you know, on the street. So. There was um, a rally for them in front of the abandoned SRO and we played for it. And the street was closed off. I don't even know if it was closed off legally, but it was closed off. <laughs> and we performed and other people performed. And so those, I think the downtown east side issues are really urgent. Um, and certainly Sawagi would always support any um, any attempts to alleviate that, that situation. In Vancouver, there are Blacks, and there was a Black community that was uprooted and pretty much dispersed, similar to the Japanese Canadian community. They were moved for um, economic reasons. The city wanted to build this viaduct. Um, from downtown heading toward out of town so that people could rush, rush out. Um, and, and their community was right there in the middle. 
so they got pretty much destroyed. Um, interestingly enough, off those viaducts, the city then wanted to widen the street to make a freeway out of town, which was going to go through the residential area of Chinatown. And a bunch of those same people who started Powell Street Festival went out with the residents and blockaded it, refused to let them work. And it did. They were successful. It got stopped. The freeway got stopped. And now they're talking about tearing down the viaducts because they kind of, these big wide things come out onto this small street, right? <laughs> Which is kind of crazy. So there's a, there are these cars tearing through Chinatown, tearing through Strathcona, which is the name of the, the neighborhood, um, on their way out of town. So it's all changing. But it's interesting that, that the Chinese Canadian community said, oh no, you are not coming through here. So, um, and I do, and a lot of those young Chinese Canadians were from that group that started at UBC. It, they, they, they were quite a, a powerful group. Today, there is not a lot of activist stuff. There isn't even much women's stuff. I mean, there is a, a woman's march every year. Um, we're not very proactive. We don't go out, and it's hard because um, they march. We don't have we don't have fan drums. We don't have anything that's really portable. We have gone on anti-racist marches with. Um, I had a I have a First Nations drum that I made. Um, we had percussion, but you know, it was actually a very small march. There weren't very many people at it. Um, so it was kind of sad, actually. Although it wasn't very big, but there were people who came out to harass. It was really, that was, um, it was interesting. <laughs> that, that for such a small demonstration, there are always people who want to push you back. I think now there would be more interest, definitely is more interest. We do have Black Lives Matter marches. We do have stuff, but I think because the population of indigenous people is larger than that of blacks here in Vancouver, the indigenous people get much more hassle than um, than anyone else. And so I think that's, that's really an issue that needs to be dealt with and worked on. You know, I'm really terrible. I'm not, I'm not really good at initiating things. I'm not a visionary. I would like to say that, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think here um, on, in Vancouver, maybe on the West Coast, oh, certainly in Canada in general, um, problems with um, relations between the police and indigenous people, um, societal restrictions on indigenous people is, um, is a major issue. Um, so Wagi was asked by Powell Street Festival in 1990, I think, or something like that, to do a collaboration, which they had asked other groups to collaborate with other cultural groups to put on a performance for Powell Street Festival. And so they, it was our turn <laughs> to be asked. And, um, and I had recently done um, a kind of improv 
with this man that Diane Cadota put in touch with me, uh, named Russell Wallace, who works at the Native Education College and runs um, a community group, um, gives drumming um, sessions for Simon Fraser, and uh, Anne grew up with a mother who was a repository of indigenous songs. And he was very close to her and he learned all of these songs. And so that's what he does is he has a group. And so he had invited me to be part of this. It's a, um, an indigenous festival called Talking Stick. And he was doing, putting together a show of different singer percussionists um, who would each do a little five minute segment and then we would do a jam. And uh, it was terrific. I, I told, I mean, it, I, about a week before I, I emailed him and said, are, are we gonna have a rehearsal? Are we, am I gonna meet these other people? And he said, yes, two hours in the afternoon at two o'clock before the show, we're gonna meet. And I'm like, holy Christ. <laughs> so that's when we're going to practice. And so I said to my husband and daughter, don't come, because I don't know what this is going to be like. <laughs> and so we met, and there was, um, you know, I, I can't even remember who the different people were, um, but there was, there was Bev who played a, a it wasn't really a, an accordion, it's more, I, I can't think what they're called, they're smaller. Um, she played that and she sang um, Balkan songs. And there was a South Asian guy who played drum and sang. And there was me and there was Russell and there was a Korean who didn't sing, but played percussion. Um, he wasn't Korean, he was a teacher at UBC. He was white, but he played Korean metallic things. Um, and so we all got together and we did our things and then we jammed and it sounded pretty good. And so then we did the performance and, and it was wonderful. It was really wonderful um, and, and fun. So anyway, when we were asked to do a collaboration, I thought of Russell. I thought this would be really good and we're gonna do a real collaboration we're, they're not just going to sing with us drumming and we're not just going to drum with them singing. They're going to learn how to drum. They're going to play taiko and we're going to learn their songs and we're going to dance. And that's what we did. We put together a real collaboration and three of them <coughs> uh, learned Renshu and, um, and they really had a good time and we had a good time and, and since then, that collaboration has had a long life. We played for the Vancouver Opera's 50th anniversary. We played up in, uh, um, near Whistler at the Lilwat um, Cultural Center. We've played in, in little pieces of the, of the collaboration, which was 45 minutes long. We played sections of it kind of all over. Um, and it, it's been this wonderful, I mean, we've all become friends because we keep doing these shows <laughs> and we know each other and we eat together and we, you know. Um, and one of the women really loved playing Taiko. And when we did a workshop, she took the workshop and just, you know, really, really was so enthusiastic. And so when we were recruiting, I suggested that we might consider her. I mean, I wasn't sure that she would actually join because she lives 30 miles outside Vancouver. She has two kids, um, she works, and it would be, you know, a hardship for her, but she does, she just loved Tycho. 
And so we asked her and she was so excited because of course we were East Asian. She was not East Asian. And she never thought that we would invite her to play with us. And so it, she was really thrilled and accepted. And she is now part of Sawagi. And I think that that kind of reaching out is an important thing. Um, because we were originally just East Asian, East Asian, right? But to expand to include an indigenous woman, I think is um, perfectly understandable. So I should say that one, one reason I thought of this was my husband at one point was um, obsessed with, um, with pottery, um, First Nations pottery. And so we, and first he started with rugs, moved on to pottery. So we used to go to the Southwest a lot because also I have cousins who live there. And we would go to Santa Fe just about once every two years. And, and in one Pueblo, um, there was no cultural center, but somebody that we met in the parking lot said, oh, you want a potter? He's, there's a potter over there. Just go over there. That's his house. Just go there. And we said, well, you won't mind if we just come? No, no. He'd be happy if you come. So we went there, knocked on the door. He was happy, he was eating lunch, but he came out and he showed us his pots and he showed me his bit and Avrin was off looking at the pots and, and he, he came next to me and he said, you know, you and me, we're the same. And I was really like, oh, this is so exciting. He says we're the same. And it's true, I think the root is, you know, if you're splitting it up into um, uh, Caucasian, Negroid, and Mongoloid, First Nations and Asians would probably be coming from the same root. And so it seemed to make sense to me that we would ask Winona to join our group because we are from the same root. We are the same. But anyway. <laughs> um, I just saying that I think all you can do is I mean we would play for any um, activist group that asked us to play any progressive social justice issue but I think just kind of trying to make relationships build contacts I think that's an important part of what can be done in Taiko. And I think it's important for people to know where Taiko comes from. Um, I think it's important to know that what we play is not just Japanese Taiko, it's Japanese Canadian Taiko. It is something we created, and um, and it is um, unique to us. And I, and Winona, I think, understands that. <laughs>